welcome to Group Think. Group Think is our dialogue series to see where we pick a topic and talk about whatever feels meaningful. Uh, my name is Madison. I'm a high school senior from Burgess, Oklahoma, and I'm joined by some amazing community members. We're going to go ahead and hop into the discussion. Today we're talking about contemporary chaos. So first we're going to start off with a word association. Um, everyone can say one of three words that they associate with this topic and explain them, but before, introduce yourself. I'll go first. Um, I'm Julia. I'm 23 years old. I live in Pennsylvania. Um, I think I have like two words. One, I guess, would it, I guess it would be speechless. Like I'm not speechless, but I think I've, there's just an overwhelming amount of opinions and thoughts on um, the situations going on right now. So it kind of just leaves you in that state. Um, and also another word would be forward. Um, also just wanting to move forward and get away from all of this chaos. Um, I'd be happy to go next. Hi, my name is Chabu. I am 19 years old. Um, I am a first year at the University of Toronto and I'm currently based in Toronto. And when I think of contemporary chaos, two distinct words come to mind. One, politics. I think that our political state is chaotic in a way that is only like related to like our current modern times. Um, and then my second phrase when it comes to contemporary chaos is navigating. It's just really hard to understand how to go about dealing with this chaos because again, they're contemporary and new to us. Okay. Hey everyone, my name is Mariam. I'm 17 and I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. Um, and then just based on everything that's happened today, my three words would be um, hypocrisy because it's very clear how like different um like protest situations are met with responses um then privilege same idea but just like because some people have the privilege of doing what they're doing right now and then other people definitely do not and then just revealing of like the state of our country that this is just kind of like happening and like almost that people aren't surprised because things have just been like escalating to this point um so yeah Hey guys, uh, my name is Angel. I'm 18 um, and I'm a first year at Yale, but I'm currently like in Maryland, right outside DC. So definitely the first word that comes to mind is frightening. Um, my mom works in DC and today has not been a good day. Um, very hectic, very chaotic, very scary for the family um, and scary for the country. I feel like this is the kind of situation that uh, that you see or that you claim to hear the US government fighting against in other countries. Um, but now we're here, that's fun. Um, and I guess another word would be festering um, because I don't think that these issues are, are novel or new in any, not necessarily in any way, but in a lot of ways um, they're this, there's this buildup of many different, of, of just many different wrongdoings um, that we've ignored or um, just wrote off because they don't seem as big as what's going on right now. But I don't know, so I'll just stacking up. Angel, how's your mom? She's good. So um, fun thing, well, not so fun, but I guess like, yeah. Um, she has, or she had COVID symptoms. So today was actually her first day off. Um, so she wasn't there today, thank God. But you know, it's like, what if? It's good. Um, I would obviously similar to what you all are saying, but I would say rage. I go back to Verda's Unplugged Conversation. I know a couple of you were there and I think rage can go one of two ways. It's like, it can make you like feel super discouraged, but it can also give you the energy to want to make change. And so I felt myself almost like internally making, trying to make that decision today because it could be very easily to be like, to get enraged and, um, and just become super pessimistic about the future. But I'm trying to make the decision to channel that rage into positive energy 
and motivation to build a brighter future. Um, I'm going to put can only imagine uh, because um, I was talking to Zoe earlier about how um, how freaked out her parents were, um, and they're all African American, and um, how you know, based on the color of your skin, right, certain type of behaviors could um, determine whether you are lying on the pavement or not. To, to quote to quote her quote Zoe. Um, yeah, so I can only imagine um, how scared some people are. You know. All right, uh, thank you all for sharing. Does anyone have something to start us off with? Question, provocation? I think um, I can start off by posing like the question slash provocation what makes contemporary chaos so unique um like in comparison to like other situations that we experience what makes this specific type of like difficult situation hard to navigate um i can go first I, um, I'm of the opinion that contemporary chaos, or at least the way that I imagine it, isn't necessarily unique um, in a lot of aspects, like I said before. But I do think that there are certain factors that contribute to this um, appearance of originality. Um, for instance, we have social media now. So things are a lot more amplified. People are a lot more aware of what's actually going on. So that, you know, increases, exacerbates the, like, the supposed magnitude of uh, the chaos that we're witnessing. Um, so that's that. And also, we're kind of a new generation, or at least the people that I talk to are of Gen Z. And I guess the last chaotic event that hit home was 9-11. And I wasn't, I was born a year after. So I don't have anything in my memory that kind of emulates what's going on right now. Something so close to home, you know, um, that has to deal with something as wide scale as democracy in general. That's kind of crazy. And third, I think also US exceptionalism or American exceptionalism plays into it. Um, I know that there's a common narrative, not necessarily amongst younger generations, but I've seen it, uh, that the United States is this paragon, this beacon of uh, democracy. Um, and with us being at like the forefront of the world, like the world hegemon, like you wouldn't see anything or you wouldn't imagine, like Gary said, you can only imagine something like this happening. Um, but when it comes down to it, when you strip it, everything to, to, its, to its bare bones, um, American exceptionalism is a fraud um, that has unfortunately disillusioned of like millions of people, hundreds of millions of people um, into believing that, I don't know, into buying into this this visage that just isn't true. So yeah. Something I will say, um, what you said really makes sense there, Angel, especially with like social media. I know that like during the pandemic, there was a lot of people, and this is not to like downplay what the seniors last year went through, um, but like in, in different periods in American history, um, seniors in high school lost their senior years because they were like drafted to war. And a lot of, and then people during the pandemic just had to stay home. 
And so I think that we like forget what has gone on during history and a lot of um, kind of like just um, like our feelings have been, I guess like exacerbated because of social media. And like you said, not having experienced a lot of other chaos in our lifetime. Yeah, I mean, also, and and I I joined kind of late, so I could be totally making a point that makes no sense. But I think that there's there's a an interesting dynamic of like I think we're at the end of another period of like human progression and like right the the industrial revolution was pretty cool, put a lot of children to work, right, did all that great stuff, and then we were like, okay, this is creating a lot of money, so let's continue to. Um, grow this entire system instead of think what, what else we can build. And so now I think we're, we're kind of at the end of that. And what COVID has seen is like, oh my God, reality's back. Everything kind of sucks and it's not all like daisies and roses. So, so I think contemporary chaos also, and like what happened today was, was very interesting. And I, I saw someone talking about how, what, what, if you strip everything down, what it really takes down is like, we've, we've totally eroded our, our culture and our like, um, individual spirit and our want to progress because we've gotten really comfortable in these systems that are really fake and only help a certain group of people. And so it definitely hits us harder because we're all connected and our like little teeny tiny peanut brains can't understand why we are all connected through technology. But I think it's also like there's a very real point in time that's coming very soon that like it's going to all crumble and be really bad or like someone's going to build something out of it. And, and these aren't like, these are just like an amalgamation of thoughts I've, I've read and heard over the past week, which is pretty interesting that it all came to today. I can't help but agree with like Angel and Tanasi in the sense that like, it's not really new. Like these are reoccurring events um, just like happening throughout history. But what makes it new or like what makes it hard to navigate is the new like generation of people that have to deal with it and then context that it happens in as well as like the tools that are available to the people who are engaging with these challenges um and those tools bring invite like new problems as well as new solutions and so i think that what's interesting is that these problems are reoccurring but our solutions are also reoccurring which is why the problems keep reoccurring but no that's a really valid point to make the fact that these aren't new necessarily new events just like different people with different tools um unfortunately reiterating what seems to be the same response but i think my hope and ambition is that we kind of learn with this these new tools that it's time to like pivot to a different way of like responding to events like these Did you all read, I know Shabi, you might've, you might've read like the beginning of it, but the Rethink X report kind of like there's the, there's, it also says that, you know, humanity will either um, resend back into like the us versus them and like super, like we'll pick a demagogue to listen to. I can't imagine how that would happen. And then we would, we would do that or we would progress and like build something that's super inclusive. So I'm, I'm curious, like what, what do you all think is like, going to happen because there's a very real possibility we do just slingshot back in time and revert into our little comfortable hate clusters. I mean, again, it could really go either way, right? But this is very much like personal biases coming into play. But I would like to think that after the like leadership that we just went through in the US, that there is like a profound understanding of the dangers of like having those really small closed group associations. Um, and so like anything remotely similar to that should be like unattractive. Like it should not be anything within the realm of like things we want because we just went through a really heavy period of experiencing that and seeing the implications. I also think that for the context of this group, I think we should state like what happened today because um, we keep referencing it in conversation. But like what's happening in DC right now with the armed pro like the armed overtaking of the house, like there's so much that is the manifestation of like that kind of mindset 
And if we want more of that, then sure, we should engage in more of it, but I would hope that that's not the case. Um, I don't have an answer, <laughs> but I feel like this has been a question that has been contemplated since like, literally since words have been invented, you know? Um, I just keep thinking back to, I don't know, bringing it back to philosophy, like the political philosophers. I'm like, just Hegel's just going around my mind right now. I feel like the crux of a lot of Western philosophy is whether or not we can finally break free from this pendulum-like pattern of going from one end of the spectrum to another without having any actual substantive um, I don't know, measure of human progress um, as it relates to, I don't know, human to human relations. Um, so, I mean, like Chabu, I remain hopeful because you have to remain hopeful. Um, like you just, you, in a time such as this, you just, you need to radically hope um, and bring radical empathy to, in order to actually, I don't know, to bring about substantive change. I just hope that we don't see, I, I was um, watching, <laughs> listening to this podcast earlier yesterday and they made this really interesting distinction between actual progress and symbols of progress. And I just hope that after seeing, after enduring the past, the, like the last four years, um, people start working towards actual progress rather than those symbols. And I feel like you kind of see it, um, see actual, like these, these instances of actual progress happening. I mean, Stacey Abrams, incredible, radical enfranchisement. I don't know, to me, that's actual progress um, amidst a bunch of symbolic hoo-ha that people like to throw around. So, yeah. Maybe. Well, I think like our generation is just consistently seeing all angles and the full scope of every every argument on the spectrum. Like today we're immersed in contemporary chaos in such a different way than people were in the past because of the internet. It's a really exhausting way to be in, immersed in something. And so like, I would just hope it makes people realize that this stuff is so counterproductive and the people who participate in these extremes are losers to be honest and want to create unity and inclusivity instead because it's just a really exhausting way to, in, to intake information and just go about life as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, oh, go ahead, Mary. So I was just gonna say kind of like going off of that and I don't know if this is necessarily like a new question, but I guess like what I'm considering is like, okay, we have all of these ideas of like radical empathy and inclusion and like how we, how can we move forward from here? But I also see like so much of this is like backtracking, if that makes sense, where it's like, oh, so many people have said like certain things during protests during the summer and now they're like doing the same things. And there's like a sense of logic in a lot of ways that it's like hard to even like combat that. So like, where do we even begin in like making progress that's like actually substantial in changing like the culture of America? Because if we can't really change that culture, then it's going to be hard to like sustain progress over time. Um, but yeah, I guess like that is another question that I've just been thinking about a lot with everything happening. Yeah, it's like, um, it, it's funny, Angel, you brought up the the whole like real progress versus fake progress or, or symbolized progress. I, I, like Gary might know where I'm going, but there's this book that someone recommended to me called Simulation Simulacra, and I do not recommend it to anyone. Um, because it was really just a tough read um, because it was just like r some guy being really mad and like trying to explain something while also just being furious. And I was like, get a hobby, dude. But um, there's like this, this idea that we've kind of gotten to an age of like, even today I was looking at these people take the capital and it's not like they, the, the, all it was was a bunch of people who were fed symbols and then not through their free will reacted to those symbols using some wiring in their brain that we all have. They just reacted in a different way. And then they kept feeding those symbols and then they took their symbols, like the American flag or the Confederate flag, and then they went to another symbol and then sat in the symbol and did really nothing. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I don't know if you read the book. I don't know if you agree with my, my representation of his writing. But um, 
yeah uh and i was like i'm like really confused of like politicians do the same thing like a lot of symbolized rhetoric like politicians have millions of followers now and like they're idolized and people have their paintings on the walls and and i look at it and i'm like there's no we're not doing anything we're going backwards we're like sliding down the slope and but we're really happy saying that we are like oh i'm a liberal are you like what have you done no you're not you're just you say you are you label yourself because it makes you feel better but i think how we begin making progress is like shattering this whole idea that um progress looks a certain way and start embracing like what you said i think progress feels a certain way progress is going to make us feel something versus make us say something so yeah i don't know what that means at all but I'm in like half agreement with you, Tanasi, um, in the sense that like, I feel like the progress that we attach ourselves to that's like really unproductive and actually has very little impact is very reactive and it's grounded in how we feel. Um, so almost like clinging to like whether it's an ideology or like political rhetoric and that is like the progress and like agreeing with that, supporting that and et cetera. Um, I think beginning to make progress is preparing to be in something for the long haul, to be in phases of like constant iteration and rethinking, to build the foundation of things that should take decades to come together and be of meaningful like contribution. So how do we begin progress? I think by first disengaging with the idea that like progress can be achieved within the span of a year or two, or like you can take tentative steps. I think a lot of the progress that we analyze is actually just like the first step of many. Um, and that if we had the attitude of like, this is going to take a long time and require the best of us and we still might not get it right is the best way to approach beginning progress. Shabu, I love what you said there about like thinking long term and this kind of ties into like the last question and answer this question as well. Um, just to reference like the rethink humanity report that uh, the Nazi referenced earlier, but basically it mentions how there's going to be like so much transportation tr transformation in like the five main sectors, which you think are like transportation materials energy information and I can't remember the last one, but basically like talking about how there are like so many possibilities. So, like, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I think the first step to making progress is acknowledging all the possibilities that we have um, for the future. And I think that like, there's going to be so many changes as early as 2024 in a lot of those sectors. I don't remember all of, like the exact statistics, but like things like housing and food being like incredibly low. And the fact that no one is talking about those is incredibly alarming because knowing that information is crucial to like how we structure society now. And so I think that like, like adopting a long-term outlook is really important for, for like just so many reasons. Six days, guys. It's been six days. Oh yeah, I forgot. I it's, it is twenty twenty one. Yeah, everyone was like, "Oh, twenty twenty one is gonna be so much different." You know, Hello. directly attached to twenty twenty, right? And centuries of of things building up. Um, I have. I don't know if we've ever done this, or we don't do this frequently. Um, but I want to put. Civics Unplugged Builders Give Me Hope. And it's not a question, but I'm just curious if anyone has a reaction to that. Yeah, I, I think, well, I mean, I'm biased reaction, but um, I think that there's a, there's a real correlation between um, the, like accepting the problem and then making change versus like making change in the system. Like there's a lot of people that like, like I used to run a social media news page, right? And it did really, really well, but I was running a news page on social media. So I was like, ooh, likes and followers and all that. Like I was, I was doing stuff in the system and kind of just causing more shit. And I think what's, what's different about builders is that like, it shows that there's a potential for anyone to get involved and make real change so long as they understand where they're working and like, um, don't, don't just work within the system, like work outside it. I actually like wrote about this um, earlier today when I was just trying to like sort through the feelings of, you know, what was taking place. And I think that not just like, like builders give me hope in the sense that like, 
you almost don't know what to say when you talk about democracy reform and then this is what's happening it's almost like evidence and proof for the counter argument like there is nothing we can do like this is the end of it all like civics unplugged is like my rebuttal statement of being like no like we are going to be okay one day eventually um and the reason why is because there's a community of 200 plus kids growing who want nothing more than to see a better version of the future so it gives me hope in the sense that like it's a very tangible thing you can refer to and hold on to or reference when you yourself may be at a loss of words or losing hope I'll add on to that, but like even before I never wanted to get involved in like democracy reform because I was like very, very like pessimistic about everything and was like, how is it going to change? Like these things keep happening. No one wants to change it. And then I got involved with Civics Unplugged and I was like, okay, like we'll see what happens. But then like as I've become a member of the community, I was like, okay, like we can actually like make a difference. And so like genuinely Civics Unplugged builders like do give me hope because I'm like, hey, like we are working towards a brighter future and we can do things that will change the systems and like make a brighter future for American democracy like we're always talking about and I think that is like really beautiful that like you can take such like I guess what's the opposite of hope like such not faith in our government but like from me and from a lot of people that I've talked to like in civics unplugged and turn that into like hope and kind of like you know referencing back to like Virto's conversation you know taking that like rage or unhappiness with the way that things are going and really like channeling that into wanting to make a difference and like working towards making a difference and then having like a, like a network of other people who want to do the same thing and it is very inspiring and like I know today when everyone is kind of like freaking out about everything there's always going to be people like Madison where like I'm just going to keep working harder and like all of you who are just going to like meet for group think well I know like Madison's outlook on like literally everything is just like this is going to give me fuel to keep going and so I, that is just like really inspiring to me too and for that I am very grateful for all of you yeah like you can see something chaotic like this and it, it would be so incredibly easy to be like well I, I have no hope for the future or whatever it is but it's empowering being with people who don't take the easy route and like don't look at things that way and push it pushes you to drive like pushes your drive um, to create something better even more. Um, I think that, I, like, once again, shipping it down, CU builders give me hope because we actually, like, critically think. Um, and I feel like a lot of issues happen because people lack the ability to critically think about what's going on around them. Um, and so just to keep it short and simple, comprehension and the ability to think for yourself is such an important skill. And it's very nice being in a community of people who continuously strive to critically think and better their mindsets because uh, mm, it seems sometimes a little bit rare. Yeah, I think that we've like allowed technology, um, at least this this form of technology, to become an extension of our minds. And then we were like, okay, everybody else think for me. And like every piece of technology is an extension of you, right? And so that and, and what I what I was thinking of today is like Facebook was created right to bully people and then rate women on a college campus, right? Like like because someone had that idea about technology like uh, 10, 20 years ago, like there was a random dude in like a Viking costume standing on Nancy Pelosi's desk today. Like, like that's, that's, the sh that's the stuff I find really, really funny. And the fact that that is what has taken away the common sense from half of this country is, is like, it's concerning, but it also shows like how easy it is to get back. Um, I would just say that like, civic sample builders are the source of my hope, like, this is like the one place in my life where it like I, I can go to and it just like gives me so much like optimism for the future. And I'm like excited for us to be that place, not just for builders, but hopefully in the future for so many other people because other people also deserve to have that sense of hope um, th that we are for each other. Love that. I'm gonna pose another provocation. Um, 
chaos is rocket fuel for revolution. I disagree with you, Gary. I think stagnancy is rocket fuel for re revolution. Chaos, chaos makes it easier for someone to take control. It provides, it provides government the, the way to like, oh, wow, there's a lot of chaos, time to control us more. And like, is that a very like traditional Republican point of view? Maybe, but I think stagnancy, like stagnancy in wages, stagnancy in the middle class, stagnancy, th that creates revolutionary tendencies. And like chaos is just a way for people to, to usurp power. I also feel like people get so comfortable with stagnancy, like they um, almost just like accepting it in a way, while if something is kind of um, pushing the narrative, people feel the need to tag along if it's something that's out of the box that they didn't consider before because of that stagnancy. I would say that. I think that um, and also like, correct me if I'm wrong, that what Gary was trying to kind of get at is the fact that like stagnancy exists, but to get out of the stagnancy, you need chaos. Like it is the turning point out of that state. Um, but my personal perspective is that it can be the rocket fuel for revolution, but in a very specific context um, where you have like the right culture, the right community, the right tools and the right like support system to turn it into something productive. It's almost like gasoline, like gas gasoline can set things on fire or you, it can drive you across the country. Um, so chaos has that duality. Um, but again, you have to be like in a system that's specifically engineered to turn it into something productive. Like it does not happen accidentally. I agree with you, Trabu. Um, I feel like when you just think about it, I don't think I can, uh, but okay, also my knowledge is also very limited, but I really don't think that I can conjure up a picture of a society or a nation or a people who have brought about significant, like severe change without chaos. But like you said, it does, there, you can't engineer um, the, the, the necessary environment, um, that is required to bring about the positive change. Like, uh, Cuba, um, their revolution was somewhat successful, but then Che Guevara, um, wanted to go to other colonized places and incite rebellion and revolution thinking that you can just manufacture this chaos and this chaos will automatically lead to like, I don't know, like an anti-capitalist um, communist revolution, right? But we see that that's not true with, uh, oh my God, I was about to say Antifa. <laughs> that's so embarrassing for me. What is that country? Oh my God. Well, a country in Africa starts with A. Uh, I feel so embarrassed for it almost saying Antifa. But you see it with there, you see it there, you see it in Nicaragua, Nicaragua, um, Guatemala. I feel like chaos can be very useful, but at the same time, it's such a volatile um, state of being. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And I feel like chaos isn't necessarily like rocket fuel for revolution. It's more like a symptom that like, people have been like brewing with all of this and like unhappiness is festering and so this is just like a manifestation that like people are ready for revolution and people are like ready to make a change so I wouldn't necessarily say that there's like a cause and effect but more like chaos is just there when revolution is like happening or brewing or like about to happen and that kind of like spills over into chaos and unrest and like people and the country. Yeah that was very well said. Yeah and I think this is not to say that there hasn't been a lot of chaos over the past year within our country, but as Angela referenced, like thinking of, I hadn't even thought about it like that, like past civilizations, like there wasn't great amounts of change without like a huge amount of chaos. And so I think that we're in a really interesting position to where we can kind of like minimize the amount of chaos in order to maximize the amount of change. Um, because of like technology and how our information systems have been changing so rapidly, like 
where this went like referencing that report again like we can either like our society can crumble or we can have a, a breakthrough and so it's really cool to be in that position but it is also a lot of responsibility and the change has to come soon in order for us um like to make it happen without a lot of chaos i think that like we've come to the conclusion that like chaos can be good and bad but i also think it's important to recognize that revolutions can be good and bad it just depends on what side of the story you're on um so i do think that chaos does fuel revolution but there's no determining what type of revolution that it fuels and if that revolution is productive or counterproductive and your stance on that is genuinely going to be reflective of like the situation that's like that you're kind of referring to or discussing. Do you think there can be significant cultural change, like actual, like like what revolutions do without chaos or violence? Because in, in like throughout history, there, there's always been either a buildup of chaos and violence towards change or direct chaos and violence to make change. So do you think that there's a possibility that we can avoid the whole chaos part, but still build a better society? I want to say no. And this is probably definitely me being extremely bleak. But just witnessing everything that I've been seeing right now, not only in the US, but like in my like home country of Nigeria with SARS and them dealing with their own version of police brutality and just watching how for a long time and just hearing my parents talk about it as well because um they grew up there their grandparents grew up um, in a very war-torn area. Um, or not their grandparents, but they themselves. Uh, it's, it's really looking like all, all roads lead to Rome. And Rome, in my honest opinion, is revolution through unfortunate chaos. Um, yeah, I don't know. I would like to think that there is a way. And um, if you guys do think that, please, I want you to inspire me um, and do the thing that I am afraid of doing, radically going beyond the state of what I'm witnessing right now and dream of a brighter future, yeah. but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, that's, I think you have a really, um, I, think, I think you're thinking about things in a totally rational way, um, I think, uh, it, I, I mean, this is me being biased, but if if CU didn't exist, I, I think that the chances of things going well this decade are are pretty slim. Um, yeah, we all love the things that we work on, but um, uh, you know, I, I genuinely believe if more people knew about what was happening here and knew like you all as individuals and as a collective, um, people would see that, well, you are literally the future of democracy. It's not just like this abstract thing. It's like the future of democracy is waiting to be the future, waiting to build that future of democracy. Like the, the living embodiments of what community and democracy could look like are waiting to be, um, to be taken seriously by, by, by the world. Um, I think that it does take, I would say that like significant cultural change does take place without chaos and violence. It's just not glamorized. It's probably like the most boring thing to read a, a book about or watch a movie about. Like there's nothing attractive about like everyday people doing everyday things in a way that's productive and conducive to a good culture. Um, I'd even argue that it's probably taken place, but there's just no history book content on it because it's not entertaining. Um, and I feel like it also comes down to like your interpretation of chaos, the Me Too movement, massive cultural significance and change, but that didn't feel chaotic in the slightest, at least not to me, um, because like it was really just like a curation of tweets and then court proceedings and articles that were written. And I guess if you're immersed in that world, it may have felt chaotic um, to a degree, but like for me that like no one, there was no like physical violence that transpired. And so I think that it can happen. 
Um, and if anything, we need to be prone to appreciating it when it does. Because if the only way that I know how to incite cultural change is through like violence and like mass protesting and all these other things, then that's my first, like imagine a version of events where the people who are at the Capitol right now had other means and ways of like expressing their disdain that didn't require violence. You'd be having a completely different conversation right now. So I think there, it's like, it can happen. We're just not familiar with the ways that it could happen. Yeah, Chaba, I really like what you said. And part of me almost wonders if like, there can be like good or beautiful chaos because I think that we could, I could see a future where there's like so many changes that are positive, but it's like things just kind of like feel chaotic because things are changing for good so rapidly. So I almost wonder if that like, I don't think that chaos necessarily has to imply that there's violence present as well. Um, and that maybe we could see a future where there's a little bit of good chaos. I just think it's interesting too. It's like we have more efficient streams of communication than ever before, but it seems like our communication is effectively becoming worse because of technology in a way. And like, again, how I mentioned earlier, I think our generation's just exhausted by it all at this point. Like today was wild, but I wasn't shook to my core. Like it wasn't unexpected. Um, and Gary, a few weeks ago, you had shared that Robert Greene podcast where it was talking about how like Gen Z, um, like a generation gets so tired of what has been going on that they create that change. And I think that's genuinely just the point everyone's at. People are, are exhausted by this. And I think we just have to reject counterproductive chaos and like do, do what CU does, um, get down to the core of issues and speak about them in a way that's effectively approaching them for the future that doesn't include violence and just, yeah, really speaking on and figure out how to approach the issues. I want to propose um, a provocation based off of what Madison said. I mean, it's just going to be a phrase, but beautiful chaos. Um, yeah. Oh, Gary, go on. Oh, okay, no, go ahead. Um, I'm just going to say, just to kind of emphasize everyone else's point that like, um, it's, it's important to note when you're jumping to a conclusion about what a word means, revolution can mean many things. Uh, chaos can mean many things. Um, so just be co be co cognizant of, honestly, how, like you may not consider it, you're being triggered, right? Like a certain image is coming to your brain and you might be getting triggered by it. Um, um, I 100% agree. I definitely think like, like stacking on your point, stacking on Chabu's point, interpretations matter. Um, like semantics do mat matter. I think, so this is gonna be like a vague uh, definition that I personally hold. I think that any change or any system that disrupts, I don't know, the oppressive hierarchies uh, is inherently chaotic. Um, and I don't think that chaos necessarily has to manifest in a physical sense. Um, like the example that you brought up, Chabu, with Me Too, I do think that that is chaotic because never before have you seen, let me not say never before because generalizations are bad, but it wasn't something that you saw on the regular basis. Um, a group of women standing up against someone who hold who held immense power over them both monetarily wise or uh i guess economically wise um when it comes to their field of work and just the fact that he stood in the position of or they stood in the position of of the male privilege that the pa patriarchy affords them um so I, I think that chaos can be beautiful if we're working towards like, I don't know, like the true recognition of the humanity within everyone, you know? Progressive politics is often called or referred to as the, the politics of recognition. Um, and recognition can go either way, either uh, white supremacy as we see uh, today or as we have seen today or towards uh, a more codependent 
um, appreciative culture. And when it goes that way, I do think that the chaos is beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of it as like art, right? Like uh, art can be interpreted different ways by different people. And usually the people who are in places of power during chaos see chaos as a violent thing, as like violent change that unseats them. And then when like the people who are creating the chaos usually see it as, as more of like a, a beautiful symphony of um, people working together to, to do something. Uh, so I, I think that the term, like all chaos can be beautiful it's just, it's less beautiful if you're standing in front of the moving train versus being in the train. I love how this like evolved into a conversation of just like redefining it or like moving the boundaries that we have around this word. Um, and so I'm going to follow the trend of like defining chaos here. And I think that it's any instance where you're moving against the tide and you're going against the grain. Um, it's like a level of like overt disruption um, of both a good or a bad thing. And that can be beautiful or it could be absolutely detrimental. Again, it depends on the instance. Uh, I'll add that um, basically everything that we do at CU is unconventional. And um, we have a lot of inspirations that we draw from and how, how we do things. Uh, one of them is uh, Netflix as a company. Uh, the CEO talks about how it's always on the edge of chaos. Um, they have like a, as few rules as, as needed to, to create a hyper creative culture. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can imagine like, for example, a social movement, right? Where there's a kind of a dictator type person that's like, saying this is how everything needs to be, right? And how many ideas are gonna come from the grassroots uh, in that case? But then if you go too chaotic, uh, everything falls apart, right? And I think a common, there's no doubt that like Occupy Wall Street, for example, um, really started a, a cultural conversation and maybe that was their goal, but in terms of like immediate kind of system change, beyond culture, um, they were kind of laughed at, right? Because of how how like deeply decentralized they were and basically didn't really have leadership. I'm oversimplifying, but obviously like the point here is that um, beautiful chaos, like chaos can probably easily uh, um, disintegrate into uh, kind of a useless mess as well. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say like, I think that if like chaos is a response to stagnancy, there's probably just beauty in movement. Like the things that, like the idea that things are actually like moving in some direction. And so like to harness that chaos and take it into a beautiful direction is kind of like what we're tasked with in a sense, like as C like at CU as an organization and other people who are trying to make reform. So I think that like, just the fact that things are moving and that people do want change and are like agitating for it and like manifesting that through chaos is like inherently beautiful, but also like we're responsible for keeping it that way and like keep it to like keep it going in a beautiful direction and like not let it descend into bad chaos, I guess. I don't want to say bad wow. because like that's a generalization, but yeah. Yeah, well, there's like so much power in your perspective and your outlook on something because like even in just everyday life, like when you're in a stagnant position in life or you're kind of more so in a loop stage of your life, like obviously not a lot of growth comes out of that. Um, but when you're shaken up a little bit or like when your eyes are open to something and it's obviously always really uncomfortable, but you can either look at that as something that's scary and something you don't want to approach or you can look at it as something that is a growing opportunity. So yeah, I'm just like perspective and outlook is big. 100 percent julia i agree and it just like begs the question i feel like so much of our perception of our perspective is like shaped by the media and i like i read this book kind of reading this book called manufacturing consent by um noam chomsky and it's it's just so eye-opening to think about like the way that we perceive the world 
and I guess like following along that line of logic, the way that we perceive chaos is like heavily influenced by the information that we consume and the media that is just constantly shoved down our throats. And I don't know where I'm going with this thought, but I don't know. It's perception is such a powerful thing. And it's just so heinous that people attempt to, I guess, alter it towards not so great ends. Well, that's just like the point that Chabu made earlier when she shared her writing piece that she has been trying to stay away from the news as much as possible to keep up her, like intake the information for what it is and try to continue to obviously have her positive outlook on how things can move forward productively. Yeah, I mean, I am also reading uh, Manufacturing Consent and what I was very interested in reading was like how systemic he saw the media of like, you know, you, you, they have like a bunch of people in power and those people kind of set what's newsworthy. And then everybody else is like, oh my God, I guess that's newsworthy. Let me do it, my job as a journalist. And it doesn't matter how ethical those people are because it's, it's always, it's just, it, they're working in a corrupt system. Um, the, the other thing that was really interesting um, is that I was talking with my friend last night and she was, she was talking about like how we got to this place. And I was like, do you, do you even think we have free will anymore? Like, do you think we have the ability, right? Because the media has defined how most of us, not all of us, but most of us see the world. Do we have free will to make decisions or is it just us being influenced by a bunch of really weird people who know how to work algorithms really well? Like Mark Zuckerberg, right? He's like an odd human. Um, and he's just, man is he manipulating all of us? Is he, are, like, do we have free will or, hmm. I think it's really hard to, um, to, to, to actually exert agency, like, uh, in, in your like like to actually make make choices for yourself uh, if you're not thinking about choice making and that you have it, it's in your it should be at least ultimately in your hands to make your own choices um, so I guess I don't know it's hard, it's not really that controversial to say like if you're not really reflecting on like the, the, that power to make choices. Um, you're almost certainly a victim of um, mimetic symbolic warfare. <laughs> yeah, and so many people don't reflect on the information that they're reading. They just intake it and they're like, oh, that's right. And that's why there's like so much, much information. The, pe the people who aren't taking the time to reflect on it more, all the stuff they're taking in. Um, this kind of like circles back to something Tanasi said earlier about how he was like, running a public magazine on like a social media platform and how he was kind of just like creating more of the problem that he was trying to address and i think that like there's a real reoccurring theme of just assuming that like we can operate within the system and just like somehow come out unscathed um i think of like every u.s president that has ever said i will do this differently and then they leave office having done everything the same exact way like what kind of immunity do we assume we all have to like live above the fray somehow, some way? Um, so I think it's just like also really important to, I almost operate with the assumption that like there are things that I am unintentionally doing in like in support of the thing that I'm against. Um, and like when you approach it with that mindset, you're like not only critical of the world and the content and your engagement, but like also you're critical of your personal approach and why you do the things you do, why you consider the things you consider, why you ask those questions first above all else. Um, so yeah, I think that's just like, you have to question yourself because like you are also integral to the system that is operating against people and like perpetuating issues. And that's an important like internal dialogue to establish. So, so well said. So like similarly, you know, if you're, so um, just like if you're not reflecting on your choice making, you're almost certainly a victim to other people's choices being made for you. Uh, and if you're not recognizing that you can BS yourself and like thinking that you're actually thinking, you're almost certainly not thinking. 
um, I, I just, I recall that like once I recognized that uh, I could BS myself and also that my detector for my BS could also be BS BSing itself. I just started to like, just, just kind of instinctively start questioning everything that I've been thinking. I think that's really important for, for people to uh, adopt and, and not, not feel like they're weak because they're questioning um, their, their thinking and their choices. Yeah, I'll just add on to both of those points. I think that like when people are operating under the assumption that we're in like a functioning system, then it's like that is like what is perfect to like keep the system going. So then like that mindset is like important to keep like like conveying, I guess, to people because like if they're not questioning anything, if they're not thinking about how things are problematic, then they like won't want to change the system that we're in. So like to Chadwick's point of like constantly thinking about how we might intentionally be like helping the system that we're trying to like fight against is like super important. Um, because like if we don't, that is just like not buying into intentionally, but just kind of like supporting the system that we're trying to dismantle in a way. Yeah, upon upon reflection of today, um, I was on the train home and I was like thinking about the year or two ago that I used to run like all that stuff. And I was like, damn, I contributed to this problem directly. Like I am a direct actor. Like I was, it was not part of Like I wasn't like a, I wasn't running like a roaring Republicans TikTok account. Right. But like, I, I was still directly contributing to the problem. And the only reason I didn't know that at the time was because I wasn't, I wasn't focused. Like I, I couldn't see the bigger picture. I don't know if I wasn't smart enough or wasn't wise enough or whatever, but like, I was like, mm, this is good. What's not good. I think what makes it hard to know whether or not you're BSing yourself and this kind of goes back to what the Nasu was saying about like, just like so much, or we've all been talking about like there being so much um, media out there. It's like every voice is out there and like every perspective is out there. So like, once you feel like you've unlearned something, it's really easy to find sources to feed like, um, like it's, it's really easy to plug into other perspectives. So I think about it like, we say like, oh, we're like unplugging from everything that we're learning at Civics Unplugged, like from the default way of living. But I think that a lot of people also think they're going through that experience. Like I know a lot of people who are like, I've unplugged because I've realized that the Democrats are all lying to us and want to destroy this country. And so it's, it's just really hard because there are so many voices um, and hardly any of them are, are, are sources of truth. This is making me um... I guess it's reminding me, reinforcing for me that a community of independent thinking, but diversely, like, um, uh, independent thinkers with diverse perspectives and experiences um, who are willing to um, basically ch check each other is, is so essential for the development of um, the leaders that we need and also the ideas that actually make sense and aren't aren't bs um and no doubt can we be better at see you at doing that but also i would say if you're not if you're not even valuing this you're almost certainly not doing this if you're not valuing getting independent perspectives that are diverse um you're almost certainly failing right because because the, the the default inclination is to just uh, surround yourself with people that think think exactly like you. Um. Um, I think that's like a really, really important thing. Like the conversation has kind of moved on to a topic that I think that we can like maybe move on to, which would be operating in the chaos. Um, I kind of just want to leave it at that, not necessarily a question. I will say that I know the time has us uh, stopped, but if you all are okay with continuing, I am. Um, but feel free to hop off at any time. Beautiful chaos. I was going to say that this, this, these conversations, probably especially this one, is kind of beautiful chaos. Um, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's cool. Um, I think that 
as you think, you expand the circumference of your thought or the radius of your thought, right? Um, so I think to effectively operate in chaos, um, you just have to continuously question, like, why do you think, and I feel like it's not even, if I'm gonna be honest with you, I feel like a lot of people have intellect over intellectualized critical thinking to the point of uh, where sometimes there is a, a sentiment that it's almost inaccessible to like the regular every man. But I feel like critical thinking just takes like three seconds. You look at something, you just take like a second to look at like, what is, what is, this, what is this showing me? What's going on here? Um, and then take another second to think, could this possibly be over-exaggerated? Could this possibly be over-conflated? What, what are the other angles that I could possibly not be thinking about? I think it's such a quick and simple process and you get so much more better or not more better, but so much more adept at doing it the more that you do it. Um, it's like a muscle. But then again, like going back, there are just so many things that there's just a barrage, an assault against our ability to think for ourselves because uh, like cultivating the herd mentality is such a, it's so lucrative when you, when you think about it from, I don't know, like from a corporation's point of view or from the system's point of view. Um, I wasn't there when you guys watched The Matrix, but I haven't finished the movie. I'm only like 30 minutes in, but I feel like The Matrix is so, it's like a, I don't know, life imitating art. There's just so much that the system doesn't want you to realize about like the bounds of the reality that we're living in. And going back to free will, I, I feel like we believe that we have free will, but we don't necessarily, we, I don't think that we truly do. But at the same time, uh, the bounds in which we are exercising our agency are also, we are complicit. We also somewhat take part in constructing it. So just realizing that, and just constantly questioning yourself is such an important thing to do when in the chaos of today, tomorrow, yesterday. And it needs to be more em further. Em yeah, I mean, the, the critical thinking one is really interesting to me because it like a muscle, it, it needs to be exercised, but like it takes a lot for people to, to exercise um, and like in any way. Um, and so what, what I find really interesting is like human nature, we're, we're always so okay with like nulling our pain and like putting it in a box um, and, and not addressing it. And so like critical thinking forces us to say, wow, I'm like dumb and uneducated. And before I have an opinion, I should educate myself. And like, that's like really mean to say to yourself. And it's, it's really hard to get there. And I think that people just are so much more comfortable with being like, yeah, I'm going to go with the herd because I, I'm like, I'm just tired and I'm unwilling to address all of this pain. So I'm just going to put it in a box and like ignore it for a little. Um, and, and like, and if I was a large corporation, I'd be manipulating the hell out of the masses as well. Like who wouldn't be, why would you not? It's, it's, if it's that easy, just like make a bunch of money. If you're in that position, maybe you shouldn't, it's not ethical and don't, but like, if you're in that position, you're obviously going to do it. So don't write that last part. I didn't say that last part. Um, I, I will say on your point, though, like, I can't blame people for not wanting to critically think because, first of all, like, with social media and the internet, it's, there's so much information that it's, like, impossible to consume all of it and to really empathize with every perspective fully. And it's so much easier to just be fed, like, you're talking about the Nazi with, like, all the symbolism and the really short phrases that are that are that are good sound bites, and so I mean I, I definitely don't blame people when um, they in reality they don't really have the tools as Shabu was mentioning to to be able to critically think. Um, so yeah. Um, I think that like Julia mentioned this earlier, but like I basically said that I went through a phase of just like not watching the news and I think the goal was to like 
be removed from the chaos, but we are in a constant state of chaos if you're being completely honest. Um, I think for me to like ask to be removed from the chaos would be asked to be removed from the reality. And then you end up falling into like all those pitfalls that Madison was mentioning. Um, and I think that a more productive method is to just have really good anchors um, because anchors allow you to like exist in the chaos without getting swept up by all of it. Um, and then they also provide you with like the capacity to respect just how chaotic things are. Um, a big part of like the conversations that I've had revolving around this were either A, like being like, oh my God, it's the end of everything, like really, really like dr dra dramat dramatic responses or people who are just like downplaying the severity of it. And so I think that like, there's like middle ground where you can't just be like completely blown away by it but you also need to respect the severity and like the scale of the issue. So yeah, I'm a big advocate for just like staying in the midst of it, but having really grounding anchors. And that could be friends, it can be communities like this one, and it can be like just like personal truths that you hold in high regard and can refer back to when things like this happen. Yeah, Chaba, there's a good, um, one of my favorite philosophers is, is Nassim Tlaib, and he has a really great theory on um, newspapers and why you should just never read the news or watch the news because everybody's trying to manipulate you and it doesn't matter. It's not going to make your life better and you should just read like one thing a week. Um, I don't know. It's, it's really interesting and there's a lot more and I'm definitely not representing it, but there's a link to a good article if you're interested. I think it'd be interesting to, like for people to, who like swear by the news to catalog like how they've actually like changed their lives because of what they've read. Um, also, like, for, like, the most breaking news, like, you're not going to not hear about it. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. I get sent links all the time. So, practically speaking, um, you may not need to just be scrolling on Twitter all the time. <laughs> um, a question I have related to operating the chaos is, what are questions that um, are useful to, 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 to ask to like when you're, you can put it, well, yeah, you can, I guess you can create a new question or questions that are useful to ask when you're in the midst of chaos. Um, as it relates to operating in it. Um, I like the question, is this new? Um, because uh, we have a tendency to have this very like hyper singular, hyper individualized view of like reality. And I mean, like, why wouldn't you? You're living now and the present is overwhelming enough. But often, like I read somewhere, history rhymes. So if history has a tendency to repeat, at least when it comes to patterns, there has to be, um, there has to have been ways that people um, adopted to combat uh, or even exacerbate the chaos that, the chaos of yesterday that is very likened to the chaos of today. And I think that asking this question can allow you to just think and imagine ways in which previous methods can be improved upon or uh, just not used at all, you know? And I think it's, maybe this is just me, but there's just, there's something comforting about the fact that like, there's just nothing new under the sun in a very general sense, because it means that there are other people who've gone through the same thing before you um, and if they were able to make it through, then you'll be okay too, so. I am like in full wholehearted agreement with Angel here. Um, I think there was an unplugged talk that we had like literally a hundred years ago, like early, early, early days of um, the first fellowship and like advice that they gave was just like to read a piece of news, not news, a piece of history every day. Um, and I really took that to heart because there's just something soothing about the fact that generations came afterwards 
like everything is survivable in some capacity or another. Um, and I also think, especially for like the people in this space that it's important to read the history of like things that are happening right now because it is the cue of like things to not repeat because they weren't productive. Um, so yeah, it's I like I think the question is not is this new, but like where can you go find where this happened already? Um, and how can you learn from that? I think similarly to that, like once you've like looked back at history and kind of like understood the context of that and what solutions have been tried in the past and where they can be improved upon, I think the question would be like, what's next? I think you should like constantly be looking to like how you can build from that chaos and and make something better out of it. I like this. Is this new? What's next? So it's, a, it's like a kind of a good thing to have handy. It's cool. That's really cool because it allows you to step out of the present moment, the chaos, because the first question is like looking at the past and the next one's like looking at the future. You're not just like stuck in the chaos and like, oh, like this is so crazy and like getting lost in it. Um, like Chabu said about anchors, I think that can kind of be an anchor too, just like uh, like setting a perspective <laughs> of like looking what happened and, and, and what's coming next. Yeah, I think also another another question could be like, what do I feel is right? I think often people don't like, I don't know, even one of my friends was telling me like, um, I, I, she's worked for like Joe Biden, she's working for a mayoral candidate. And she was like, yeah, I just haven't really explored my own political views. Like, I don't know what I believe about politics. And it's just interesting that a lot of people will, will spend their whole lives like working for politicians who have strong beliefs, but won't have them themselves and don't feel very strongly about anything. Then honestly, I know that I've like struggled with that in the past too, because like there, there's a line between like being really open-minded and empathetic about views. And like, I feel like you can be that too much to where you don't know what you believe in just because like you almost see too many sides. And I think that's where I've been for, um, for, for a large part of my life is like, not knowing which ones like and again like I think Gary has kind of like given me more permission to be okay with that because I don't know I feel like there's a lot of things that you don't have to have opinions on um but there are ones so I just think it's like a delicate dance between like being open-minded and actually knowing what you believe in to Madison's point I think that like I want to strive for empathy um, but it's very, like, there's a very thin line between striving for empathy and embodying empathy, and then also, like, condoning things that just, like, simply aren't right, um, and so I think I want to also, like, propose a question, which is, chaos aside, what matters, and then the follow-up thought of how can you go seek those things out right now, um, I feel like a really great reaction to things would just be like to almost like realign yourself with like core values and like be saturated in that. Um, and then you can have like almost like more level-headed thinking in response to the chaos. Um, I think that what matters also, I, I feel like I constantly ask myself this question and I'm stealing this question from this podcast called Bobo and Flex. Everyone should go listen to it. It's so amazing. But uh, they, they phrase it as, do I have the range? And I just, I love it so much. And I feel like it relates to Ch the, this new question that Chabu just proposed. Um, I think that what matters is your range for certain topics. I find that a lot of people like voicing their opinions on things that they have little knowledge about. And that's great. Um, you have the agency, the free will meh, to do so, but um, are you taking up space for what could be 
a more useful, productive and progressive conversation. You know what I mean? Um, like, what's a, an example? Hmm, I can't think of anything right now. But let's say that something like something international relations happens, uh, related happens, um, I don't know, in Korea. I personally do not have a lot of a very large knowledge base when it comes to Korean politics, Korean history, and what's going on over there. Um, do I have the range to really comment on something very intricate and nuanced that's going over there? Not really. And if I do, then I'm just taking up, I'm clogging up you what could be useful space. So I think it's really important that we ask ourselves, like, should I be speaking right now? Is it necessary that I chime in? Yeah, I think there's just a lot of issues right now with people not reflecting on how productive what they're doing is like people need to ask themselves not only what they're adding value to when they're taking part in something but also what they're taking value away from when they take part in it because there's a lot of like I said earlier just a lot of counterproductive initiatives yeah I think that um again the, the I've really harped on the media today um but the, like I think people are tricked into thinking that they know a lot about something and like, this is going to sound really mean, but some people are just like so ignorant that they don't know that they're ignorant. You know what I mean? And like, I always find myself in conversations with people like that don't even like politics, especially family who like aren't politicians. They don't work in the space. They're like, like, yeah, I'm an accountant. And I have a dog. Like, okay, cool. And then they're like, you're a demon for a, being a Democrat. And I'm like, is it like, do you deserve to take oxygen up speaking these words versus sitting in your chair and not speaking those words? And like, there's, it sounds very elitist, but like some people just, there's no point. It's like, it's, it's zero, it's, it is zero sum. Like them talking takes away from my lifespan. And I just, it's like, maybe you shouldn't. So yeah, I agree with it. I agree with you, Angel, on that one. Mariam, what matters? to you such an interesting question gary thank you for asking no okay um well i don't know i guess like something that i was thinking about at least like reflecting on this question and fanasi kind of like back to what you were saying is before i used to be like super justice oriented so if like someone came at me i was like i'm gonna engage in this conversation we're gonna get, get down to the bottom of it and like i'm gonna convince you like why you're wrong and like why we need to move forward together but like now i'm like there's really no point in like productively engaging in this conversation i'm not gonna get anything anything out of it like you're not going to change your mind and so like why are we just like like you said wasting our ox oxygen here and like my time when I could be doing better things so I think like in chaos a lot of the times that's some some like way that I've matured a lot and is like no I don't need to be kind of like engaging directly in this chaos and I can be like doing my own thing and figuring out how I can make a difference not like directly engaging in a lot of unproductive things um, and so I think kind of like removing yourself from like unproductive situations is really important in these chaotic times um, and like figuring out ways to not stoke like more bad chaos, if that makes sense, because I feel like people when they don't get that big picture perspective, they can just kind of like intermix themselves and like everything that's happening and not really realize that they're doing more damage than like what they could have been doing if they just kind of had like removed themselves in the beginning. So yeah, there's definitely a lot to unpack, but I definitely think that getting perspective and kind of removing yourself sometimes is like way better than directly engaging with it. And I, I kind of want to challenge what both of you are saying here, because I think that there's a balance, like just because like someone like, obviously like just because like someone doesn't agree with you doesn't mean you shouldn't like engage in that conversation because like Recently, when I've really started to understand the value of listening, I have learned so much more than before. And often, it, the conversations where I've learned a lot from people, it's people that I don't agree with that do not get, <laughs> like, ha um, get their information from, you know, credible sources. But the reality is, like, that's so many people. And if we're not listening to the people who don't really understand or have like credibility or range in what they're talking about then we're not going to understand most people 
So I think that there's like a balance for that too, especially in the work that we're trying to do and trying to reach so many people. Like sometimes you have to engage in things that aren't going to be inherently productive, but maybe you can make them productive if you make it about like listening to them and learning from them in order to um, like, to, in order to like equip you with knowledge to, to help you grow. Yeah, at the, the, the very least you understand more other types of people. Like, and I think we need, we need to dispense with the notion that you have to convince people of something. Um, one of the, the most probably useful lessons um, I got in the last two years was um, you have a conversation not to convince, you, you have a conversation to understand, like in, 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 as, in as good a faith as possible. Um, and also just like, this is just like, it's just cognitive science. Um, like it takes time for people to change their mind. Like they have to like sleep on it for many nights and think about it and like, so you're not gonna do it on the spot either. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think there's like, there's definitely a lot we can learn from people. And then there's some people that are argumentative and those people, like if you're gonna argue with someone that's pointless, but like if you're, if you're learning, yeah, because right, there's like an S curve of adoption, like early movers, people that can change their minds. And then once they do more and more people, like if you can push those first people, I, I guess it's just like, again, not like sweeping statements. Everybody's kind of a different conversation. Um, what I'll add, and I think we should wrap up this, this section is um, a big, uh, and I don't think this is like, we, we haven't really talked about this as a community that much, but um, I think like, you know, if we were to choose like trying to convince people that are already like really rigid in their beliefs and have a like a, a a tribe that they're like evangelists for or like just activating people that are ready like they're ready like gen z like not all not not all of you right but um a big like probably millions and millions in america are ready to like um have a much better sort of empowering civic education maybe they don't have the words to describe that yet um but uh we haven't even we haven't even come close to empowering the people that are ready to be empowered that are, are receptive to um creating a, a democratic culture that is like full of radical empathy and um systems thinking etc um so we transition to reflection medicine yeah, I'll go ahead and send the link in here. Wow, that was like, that was so good. <laughs> We've never gone that far over on a group thing. Yeah. Gary, that was a really good point about listening though. And and Madison too. Really, really good point about listening. Wait, this will, Tanasi, this will be your first reflection section. So yeah, you can, you can, you can sh sh um, share those observations here. Um, so basically, you can reflect on anything that's been said here. Do you see trends? Um, you can reflect on the actual conversation itself, like the structure of groupthink. Um, you can reflect on how people interacted with each other, whatever. And also, um, we encourage you to think about how this conversation is going to change the way that you operate in some way or think. I'll just say that I, oh, sorry, no, Mark. No, I, I just to say that, like, I really appreciate what Chabu said about anchors. I know that I've struggled, as she has, with, like, finding a balance between watching the news, not watching the news, um, but not trying to, like, um, like, stay out of touch with reality. And I think that I should probably, s I don't know, it, it's hard to say. I guess, like, I am... I'm uncertain about what to do about that because I also understand what Gary's saying about like, if it's big news, you'll probably hear about it. But I think there also is value in more deeply understanding what's going on. And so, I don't know, I guess I'm just kind of like having an internal conflict right now about application in terms of this conversation. What do you usually read? Like, what is the news to you? 
so I, I, I would say that like I've gone through a period over the past couple of months to where I don't really actively engage with the news, but I used to like be signed up for a couple of daily newsletters that would go to my email and I'd read them in the mornings and then I'd like go to the news app on Apple and like scroll through all the different stories like that'd be like a daily thing um but I don't do that anymore and part of me is wondering if that's something that I should like partially re-engage in or not um just based on things that everyone has been saying during this conversation yeah I was gonna like talk about the same thing and also like ask for recommendations because we had a like a group think on media a while ago and we were talking a lot about like bias and like how we can kind of like disengage from like news that is biased but also like there's a really good thing to be said about understanding where people are coming from like what's the general consensus of our country right now because like how can we operate to change what people are feeling and thinking if we don't know what people are thinking and feeling so I guess like that is also something Madison that I'm like currently like grappling with in terms of my own media intake um but in terms of reflection from this conversation I've definitely thought a lot more about like connotation because like chaos and revolution I feel like in my mind is seen as very like out in the streets and like people are like sometimes violent and that's the way that it has to be to like get things done and I never really thought about like beautiful well I guess like the fact that we have to put beautiful in front of chaos just like makes us think that chaos is like an inherently like negative word um but connotations and like the language that we use around a lot of things is just something that I've been reflecting on a lot just throughout this conversation in general awesome Um, this isn't necessarily my reflection yet. Maybe it is. But like to Madison, um, just like internalizing what you're saying, just the conflict with not necessarily knowing whether to like engage or to disengage and when and how long and just all of that um, thought spiral. It's just, I think we also need to remember that um, awareness is very, it's um, a very heavy, pretty, it's emotional labor of, of, of a pretty big magnitude, you know? Just knowing everything that's going on in the world. Yes, there are positives, but there are also a lot of negatives and that takes a huge toll or it can take a huge toll on someone's like mental well-being and just like overall wellness. Um, I remember coming across this post on Reddit um, on like this like critical theory sub and someone was talking about how they just get so sad and like depressed when like engaging with all of these different forms of knowledge because like the more you know the more first of all the more you recognize that you need to know um, and the more you get a little bit down about knowing just exactly what suffering people are going through. So I think that area of how much and how often you should engage is up to you and how you feel that your state of being is at that, like in the present, you know? Like for me, I, after, uh, what is it, May? After George Floyd, I had to disengage because it was just depressing. Um, and that's okay, you know? it's important that we understand where people are coming from and the situations that they live in but don't put other people above yourself you know what i mean because like at the end of the day all you really have is you um like you're living in your head 24 7 so it shouldn't you shouldn't like sacrifice other people or your own happiness just for like other people i don't know I guess that's my reflection and application. Yeah, I think mine is is a lot like related, but like what what the point of a lot of things are, and the the value that they add or the the value that they take. Like with with my news intake, I used to read all the news, and it used to make me really depressed. And like then I realized that the reason why a lot of kids are depressed is because we have like we read more words a day than probably people like hundreds of years ago read in their entire lives. 
And like, that's, they can't, the brain cannot evolve that quickly. And so it probably makes us really depressed, especially when there's no way to apply all of the knowledge or suffering. There's no way to fix it, right? Because our brains always want to fix something. And so the, the point, I guess I'm looking to say that I really need to figure out the point of a lot more things that I do especially in conversation, like is the point to learn is the point to argue is the point to do this or that. And then with media and consumption in general, like I've really liked enjoying, like just growing my knowledge and like learning about stuff, like, like reading really weird theory that can just help change the way I see the world. But like, I, I know there's genocide going on in the world from like Twitter when I scroll through it once in a while. And I know there's, there's stuff like that, but I don't really want to read accounts like paragraphs and paragraphs of human suffering because I can't fix it. And even wow. if I went to go join the Peace Corps, I wouldn't be able to fix wow. it. And it's just going to make me sad. And like, that's selfish because I should be suffering like everybody else. And if you want to bring religion into it, but yeah, that's, yeah, that's my reflection, I guess. Well, and think, of, and think about how, um, I, I used to think this way as well. And I'm sure Thanasi, you can resonate that it, you as someone that had a media platform well, like it's my responsibility to shove this shit in people's faces so they care and like think about the fact that like there's literally millions of people uh constantly just trying to one-up each other and sharing the most like 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 my suffering is more suffering than you and so at at, at any moment you're maxed out in terms of algorithmic suffering all the time Ooh. Yeah, it's like a flywheel effect. Like, dude, everybody wants likes and what gets likes is human suffering, which is really sad. And then the because we use technology as literally an extension of our emotions and our brain, we feel the pain of everybody else collectively on ourselves. And then we walk through life and we're like, why am I so depressed when all I do is go to school and go home? It's because I also witnessed the horror of genocide and the, the sadness of famine and poverty and the totalitarian like like slaughter of millions of people on a daily basis i'm like oh well said um so i've learned a lot i personally learned a lot from all of you in this amazing hour and 40 minutes <clears throat> um curious if uh, how this has helped you process this moment Um, well, I'll say that in general, I think like before ever having a space like group thing to think about this in like a productive way, I feel like any chaotic events would just kind of like fuel disillusionment and like with people just continually like posting kind of just like resonates in that echo chamber of like, oh, this is bad, but it's nothing new and the world's bad and blah, blah, blah. And then it would just kind of like be discontent brewing and so I think that like having group thing to just like talk about it productively and like ways that we can move forward in the future has been really helpful um personally so that I can kind of change the way that I approach this topic and like the way that I'm thinking about things and kind of like rewrite that internal dialogue as well as like the way I'm approaching it externally like through my actions Um, I agree with Miriam. It's really nice to have a space to talk without being judged. Um, I would like when I, okay, so really bad, but I woke up at like 4 p.m. today and suddenly like I wake up to what is seemingly, seemingly a coup, right? Um, like literally in my backyard. And so I go on Twitter and I'm like really plugged into like Yale Twitter, like Yitter. And it's just so, uh, it's, it's a lot. Um, very depressing, very self-righteous, um, not an echo chamber that she would like to be consumed in. So then I take myself, I see like the, the news, I hear my parents watching, then I go to Reddit and I go to r slash politics and then I go to r slash conservative to see what they're saying. Even more depressing. Um, so when Chabu, or when Gary mentioned uh, contemporary chaos as the topic of this group think, I was like, yeah, because I needed to talk to someone without a, like my parents um, invalidating me, B, 
Twitter invalidating me, see Reddit invalidating me. And it just feels nice to be validated and recognized. So yeah. Yeah, uh, there's a there's a there's a power to a space where you can kind of like talk about cool ideas and people are like, oh, and then I'll share my cool idea. And then there, there it's not like, mm, I'm so smarter than you and my idea is better than yours. It's like, mm, I don't want to be I don't want to do that. To your point, okay, sometimes when I come to groupthink, I'm like, how is everyone so smart and like knows everything and are like thinking about things? But as we like, as the conversation progresses, like literally without fail, everyone always has something really insightful to say. And like without like saying, oh, I wanna say something profound. They're just like, they just talk. And it is like actually really interesting. And so I think that like, it is really cool how like group groupthink facilitates a conversation where everyone's able to like talk without you know what angel said being judged or fanasi like no one thinks they're like better than anyone else but yeah it is really interesting how that progresses over group things so yeah or we're just all elitists and we come here and, and are like convening of the elitists anyone have any final thoughts before we wrap up Oh yeah, I think we're good. Um, Are we still recording? Yes. Okay. Well, don't put this in, but like Josh asked me if groupthink was the same thing that like led to the rise of totalitarianism in like Italy and Germany. I was like, yeah. And then I thought about it. I was like, why? Are, I was like, mm, this is a big risk that you all took here naming this that like that. But I uh, yeah, I admire it's, it. It's it's a, it's a joke. Um, oh oh, I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how do you, I think like people are so actually afraid of that word that they don't think together anymore, right? Ironically, people are thinking in silos in like fake, fake families. Like tr what, what are like internet mimetic tribes? Like just like a bunch of loners, you know, hate to say it, that are like finding camaraderie with people that they've never met um, that are bonded by like simplistic notions of how the world works. Um, so the kind of the simple brilliance of this is that we're, we're, sh we're showing the process by which we're doing the thinking. And if people actually want to critique like, like how the conversation unfolds, we're open, open book and they can contribute. Um, so Gary, what's up? Oh, haven't, uh, none of us have ever met, I guess, except for you and Thanasi. <laughs> Right. Well, good, good, good techni technical. <laughs> I want to, I really want to have a group think where we all just like meme on Gary for a while. I, I have a lot of pent up hatred for Gary over the past two days. <laughs> wow. And I'm going to um, go make dinner. Bye, guys. Okay. All right. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.